So I'm going to start off with a short video, actually. Mago night end to end delivery again, though. I mean, that sir, I'm going to manage that. I'm going to do Mago all sorts of things. I'm going to do that. This is all I'm going to do. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to do all the Many babies have died. Because hypothermia, I told you, is a potential killer, a silent killer, an unwarranted killer, an unrecognized killer. That's a big problem in the world. So many millions of babies dying every year. And about 20 million low birth weight babies born world over every year. 8 million of them in India. That's just one of the big global health problems. Me and other folks at Embrace have been trying to solve this problem, and our solution was to develop an infant warmer that can work without electricity okay, and can be used in remote settings and can even be used by a mother. And the basic concept of it is something called a phase change material. It has the ability to maintain constant temperature of 37 degrees Celsius while releasing heat for the baby. But today, I'm not going to be talking about this device. I will try and share some lessons I've learned in this journey of what it takes to innovate in the medical device space for the emerging world, okay, for developing countries. So let's look at how, um, what status quo is. How does, how, do medic how does medical device technology come to the developing world today? Usually, technologies are developed in the West. They are certified there. They are sold there and gain acceptance. And some multinational company brings it to the developing world. Let's take the example of India. A multinational company brings the device to India, reaches some high-end settings. Over time, in order to increase market share, they start reducing their feature set and dropping price. Meanwhile, local competitors also adopt the technology and the price competition starts. And the competition is a downward trend in feature set and price. Somewhere along the way, once the product has enough traction in the private segment, the government decides that this has been proven enough and decides to adopt. That's what happens today. Right? So. Uh, but there are some fundamental differences that exist between the healthcare systems in a country like India and the healthcare systems in the West, where these devices are, these technologies are typically designed. What may some of those differences be? This is just a picture of what a hospital looks like in the West, a healthcare setting. Compare this to what you might find in a setting. And this is not even the most remote settings I'm pointing out here. What are some key differences that exist? So I, I put them into three buckets broadly. There are differences at the caregiver end, which is the doctor or someone else. There are differences at the patient end. And there are differences in the ecosystem in which all of this is happening. What are some differences at the doctor end? Well, uh, one, one difference that was pointed out earlier was the huge difference in the doctor to patient ratio. Right? We have a tiny, tiny doctor. We have very few doctors for the number of patients that we have. Right? If you, uh, we have a very diverse healthcare system. Healthcare is given by in a government healthcare setting, private healthcare settings, and NGO-run clinics. The incentives in these systems are very, very different. For example, if you're trying to save the patient money, in a private healthcare system. And in the process, in a doctor-run clinic, if the doctor is going to lose revenue, why would the doctor adopt that technology? It does not make business sense because, and frequently, therefore, in the private segment, the doctor is also, also has business compulsions. In the government setting, there is very little link between performance and incentives for a doctor. And you see the implication of that in the quality of care frequently provided in the government setting. And so on. And there are, you can also look at the NGO setting and point out 
similar differences. So we have, we have a very diverse healthcare setting. And finally, on the caregiver side, I'd say that the doctor is not the only caregiver. We have many auxiliary caregivers and experts in the country. They include nurses, pharmacists that we go to for simple healthcare queries. Um, there are government healthcare workers who provide care to remote areas. And finally, we have a large cadre of grandmothers who are domain experts and uh, in the family. On the patient side, we have economically disadvantaged patients. What does that lead to? It means that in the doctor-patient equation, there is an asymmetry in empowerment. What this means is, frequently a doctor is making not just a medical decision, he is also making an economic choice for the patient. Technically, these are supposed to be separate, but that is not reality. If a, pa if a patient cannot afford a treatment, no point in doctor prescribing the treatment. So the doctor makes medical judgment, combining economic considerations for the patient. There, uh, uh, our patient's population is typically less educated. This leads to information asymmetry. What does that mean? Patients frequently have limited ability to follow instructions or read instructions. The ability to use a user interface is limited. A device might say, in case of a query, call the customer service number. What do you do in the, and, I, and we've had patients of this kind, what do you do if the poor woman in the village says, I only know how to receive calls. I don't know how to dial a number. Frequently the case. Um, this can also often lead to erroneous practices. For example, in dosage. Uh, this was in a small town outside Pune. Uh, actually, it was in a village outside Manchur, where I was doing some field research. And one of the things I told her as we were testing early prototypes was, hey, there's a little temperature indicator on the side. Uh, what you should do is heat this up. And when this line shows green, okay, uh, line, goes in, uh, line shows 37 degrees Celsius, okay, that was the number strip. Where the line shows 37 degrees Celsius, you should stop heating, and that's what the baby needs. So these women look at me and say, Western medicine is really, really strong. So when the doctor tells me to give my baby one spoonful of medicine, I play it safe and give the baby half a spoon. If you tell me to heat it to 37, I'll want to be safe, so I'm going to heat it to 30, something like that. And I have alarm bells going off in my head. These are, uh, once again, not situations you typically face in the Western healthcare system. So that's, those are some differences in the patient side. And finally, there are fundamental differences in the ecosystem that exists. And these are, for example, there are things taken for granted in the Western system. Continuous electricity, clean, clean water, access to information, good roads where you can provide emergency care, banking systems, for transactions to happen, and, and a host of other things that are taken for granted that don't necessarily exist in our context. Someone mentioned regulatory framework. In emerging markets, the regulatory framework is typically a weak regime. Add to this the fact that you have difficult distribution channels, and frequently it's not economically viable to service small towns for, for medical device companies. So I've been listing out problems here. Okay, these are, many of these are problems because these are differences that exist between the Indian context and the West where most of our medical devices are designed. So at this point, is it a, any surprise to any of us that there may be, this might not be the best way that we're going about getting our medical device technology and hence the need for taking a fresh look. Right? And typically, what, what are some things that this leads to? At the highest level, this leads to patients not being able to access high quality care at affordable rates, and our macro health indicators continue, continue to remain where they are, right? So what we have is status quo. This, by the way, is a frequently found infant warmer. They're basically light bulbs. This is what this leads to. So how might we go about doing this differently, I go back to my alma mater 
uh, which is the D school at Stanford, and they propose something called design thinking. It's an iterative approach. And I, I see that it's an approach that many are taking these days to develop technologies for emerging markets. And I believe it's, a it's an approach that is appropriate for the sort of things we are trying to do. Uh, you'll find lots of information on this process out there, but I want to I touch on a few key aspects of what, how is this process different from traditional processes. One, deep empathy with the user. Sitting in my lab in Bangalore or San Francisco, I would not find out that women in villages believe that Western medicine is really strong and these are some actions that they may take. Right? So by the way, we don't have 37 degrees and numbers written on the system today. We actually took choice away from the user and it's a yes, no, like okay, not okay. Right? So it's a situation where we actively took, took choice away from the user. Um, a second important aspect of developing solutions in this setting is to look at framing the problem right. And I give the example of how in our education, okay, whatever stream we are in, if you go back to our school and college, we're always taught how to solve problems well. We're never taught where to find the right problem to solve. Have you ever had to set your exam paper? In the real world, no one gives you the problems to solve on a platter. And so framing the problem right is actually a very, very key step of solving, the right sol uh, solving bigger issues. And that is an iterative process, which brings me to the nature of this diagram, which is where you see all these loops. The development process is not a linear process where you say, Oh, I have a problem, here's a solution, done, I take it to market. No. The development process is one where you actually build solutions, not just to solve the problem right, but also to discover the right problem to solve. It is when you take the wrong solutions out that people tell you that, that you, people may not tell you that you find that you're solving the wrong problem. Okay. And the third thing that I'd emphasize is that this is an iterative process. This process goes on, and what you're trying to solve is, a, what you're offering is not a product, but a solution. And a product is only one piece of it. And so there, the, the other pieces, I'm not going to go into an exhaustive list, but there are many other pieces that become important. For example, delivery models. Uh, how do you provide training in settings where people don't know how to use these devices? How do you provide, how do you, uh, how do you actually have distribution channels and product service? So each of these solutions need to be iterated upon, and, that, and what you prototype are therefore not just physical solutions, but also solutions to the larger problem. And um, with that, I'll actually go back to a video. We've, we actually took this approach at Embrace, and we're still on that journey. We're still prototyping our solutions. This product that's been out there in the market for some time and by now have helped has helped over 9,000 babies, um, is still an evolving product. More importantly, it's an evolving solution. We are still discovering the right delivery models, the right training programs, and the right ways to scale this product. Uh, definitely small inventions like this can make big difference. So the main advantage of the warmer, um, the Embrace warmer is to, its, it's portability, its uh, ease, ease of use, and uh, uh, safety. So definitely it can uh, change the life. We had a 900 baby. We needed to put him on a radiant warmer. Not a single warmer was available. Immediately we thought of embrace and we put the baby inside that. There is no separation of the mother and child. I feel that's the most important benefit. And mother can feed the baby as and when baby requires and uh, the bonding is improved. This is uh, reliable, hygienic and effective. We have a lot of questions about our own. We have a lot of questions about our own. We have a lot of questions about our own.
ಕಂಡೆಂಟ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಬೇರೆಯವ್ರಿಗೆಲ್ಲ ಒಳ್ಳೆಯದಾಗಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಅನ್ನೋದೇ ನನ್ನ ಆಸೆ Thank you.